Israel and Hamas have categorically denied reports of a ceasefire to allow foreigners out of South Gaza and humanitarian aid in. U.S. media had reported that Egypt would reopen the Rafah border crossing for several hours, but it is still currently closed. Thousands of people are gathering there in the hope of leaving Gaza ahead of an expected Israeli ground offensive. Israeli airstrikes have killed more than 2,750 Palestinians since last Saturday. The number of Israelis killed in Hamas's assault now stands at 1,400. The Israeli army says 199 captives are being held by Hamas in Gaza. The conflict has forced more than 1 million Palestinians from their homes in nine days. Doctors say hospitals in Gaza will use up their last reserves of heal within the next 24 hours. Arise News Chief Correspondent John Cookson reports from the Israeli city of Tel Aviv. UN-flagged fuel trucks head towards the border with Gaza and Egypt, but they used a goods crossing point, not the main crossing at Rafah. Dashing hopes the Rafah crossing was to open under a deal agreed between Israel, Egypt and the US. Meanwhile, Palestinians with foreign passports waited in vain, hoping to escape and freedom. And still they turn up in their hundreds. Many have lost their homes in Israeli airstrikes and are uncertain if they leave Gaza, they will ever return. This young Palestinian woman says, Nowhere is safe in Gaza. We have to leave to get out to save our lives, she says. And this is what she and many thousands of others left behind. A scene of utter devastation after days of Israeli bombing. Apocalyptic. The end of civilization, at least for Jabalia in the north of Gaza. One of the oldest refugee camps in the world. Those who live there fear their homes will never be rebuilt. The bodies of those who couldn't escape still remain under the rubble. And there's a toddler trapped under a collapsed concrete pillar. Desperate volunteers struggle to free the child. He's rescued, seemingly still alive. What happened to his parents, no one knows for sure. A Gazan British passport holder tells of the realities of war in Gaza. The war really has affected Gaza in a horrible way. There's homes have been destroyed, there's people sleeping on the streets. You can see rubble nearly everywhere you go. It's really, it's horrible. There's fires, smoke, uh, anywhere you look. There's sand everywhere. It's, it's, it's like a war zone. It is a war zone. In another snapshot of life, in the town of Khan Yunis, in the south of the Gaza Strip, volunteers are filling canisters for families with untreated salt water as the normal water supply long since ceased. He says, now we're filling with salt water. I'm ready to drink the salt water. What else can I do? On the Israeli side, more sadness. In Jerusalem, prayers as Israelis bury their dead from the October 7th attack. A nation still in shock from the brutality of what happened when Hamas gunmen burst out of Gaza. On the border with Gaza, the Israeli military wait. Powerful, ready to strike, motivated to battle an enemy fighting a holy war. They're waiting for the order to move as a powerful ally cautions against an occupation of Gaza. I think it'd be a big mistake. Look, what happened in Gaza, in my view, is Hamas and the extreme elements of Hamas don't represent all the Palestinian people. And uh, I think that uh, it would be a mistake to, uh, for Israel to occupy Gaza again, we did, but, but to going in and taking out the uh, the extremists, the uh, Hezbollah, 
is up north, but Hamas down south is a necessary requirement. Once the expected ground invasion of Gaza gets underway, Israel's short-term strategic goals are to defeat Hamas and free the hostages. The long-term aims are far less certain. John Cookson, Arise News, Tel Aviv. Meanwhile, in a latest development, United States Secretary of State Antony Blinken says President Joe Biden will pay a solidarity visit to Israel on Wednesday following the Hamas attacks. For more on the conflict in the Middle East, we now join Arise Chief Correspondent John Cookson in Tel Aviv, Israel. Good morning, John. Thank you for joining us today. Good morning. Great to be on All the right. morning show. John which I just talked about the fact that uh, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken has said that President Joe Biden will be visiting Israel tomorrow, and this is quite significant. What does this signal for the President of the United States of America following a visit by uh, the U.S. Secretary of State who had held long hours discussing with the war um, chambers of Israel to now come himself to visit, we, we played a video there where he was talking about the fact that there were civilians involved and terrorists in Palestine, in Palestine should be the ones that should be targeted and they're different from civilians. What's the significance of his visit tomorrow to Israel? This visit is hugely significant. Uh, 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 it's a pivotal moment in Israel and also Palestinian history. It's extraordinary that a president of the United States comes to uh, what's in effect a, a war zone on the eve of battle uh, to meet with uh, a, an ally like uh, Israel. And uh, one, one thinks of all the security arrangements that have to be around a presidential visit, like a 30 nautical mile exclusion zone around Air Force One and all the paraphernalia on the ground. The fact that Biden is coming is, is, is really extraordinary. Uh, he'll arrive in Israel tomorrow, as you say, and then go on to Jordan uh, for meetings with uh, Palestinian President Mahmoud, Mahmoud Abbas, King Abdullah of Jordan, and Egypt's uh, President uh, al Sisi. I, I think uh, the Biden visit uh, has four aims. First of all, to reaffirm America's rock-solid support for Israel at this at this crucial time. If, if, if that was needed, because he said it so many so many times before, and Blinken has said it on, on, on two visits to the region. Secondly, to try to make some progress, lay, lay some groundwork for the release of hostages. Uh, Israel says there are 199. Uh, Hamas is claiming to hold 250 hostages, most of them Israelis, but many foreign nationals. Uh, thirdly, to get some assurance from Israel about uh, uh, lessening civilian casualties because that's the message that Blinken has been getting from uh, the, the uh, six Arab states that he visited earlier this week, that whatever Israel does, it must take care to, to, to uh, make sure that civilian casualties in this battle zone of Gaza uh, and, uh, that few are killed as unnecessary and uh, sadly many Palestinians are, are going to die, unfortunately. And then the other pressure from Arab states that Blinken has to, and, and, and Biden has to try to negotiate with uh, Israel, is to get this vital humanitarian aid in. Now, hundreds of trucks, as you saw in my report, are still stacked up on the other side, in, uh, on the Egyptian side of the border, in, in, in the Sinai. Uh, you can see them here. They're laden with vital supplies, medical supplies, uh, food, uh, I have to say coffins too, uh, and these have been donated from countries like the UAE, uh, Turkey, Egypt, uh, uh, of course. But so the Sinai is a, a very delicate zone for the Egyptians. They, they don't allow people in uh, uh, automatically. It's a, still classed as a military zone by, by the Egyptians. I've been to that border crossing, I've crossed over into Egypt, it's a, it's a godforsaken place at the best of times. And still, uh, Palestinians with American passports are, are, are queuing up on, on the Gaza side of the frontier to try to get through. They were told to uh, go there yesterday and the, the border crossing would open at nine in the morning and close at one in the afternoon. It didn't happen, uh, but still they're waiting. And sadly, overnight, uh, Israel has bombed the region, not the crossing itself, but certainly Rafah and Khan Yunis, the nearest town. And uh, the latest figure I have, uh, according to Hamas, 
is that uh, 70 Palestinians lost their lives overnight alone uh, due to uh, Israeli bombing. Well, uh, John, uh, good morning. I, I, I guess the major issue will be what difference would President uh, Biden's uh, visit make? Israel has already closed the two other crossings uh, out of Gaza, which lead into Israel. Uh, Israel is busy bombing uh, uh, the Rafah crossing. Egypt is saying it's not to blame. Uh, would uh, President Biden's uh, visit make any difference? And how much of a threat does Iran pose in this particular conflict? Because Iran is still part of the conversation, even if Iran at the moment is still exercising restraint. What difference will Biden's presence make? Well, I've spoken to a lot of Israelis in, in, in the last few days, and it, they, they, they watch his statements on TV, and they greatly welcome what Biden has said. It, 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 this massive support from an American president is hugely welcomed by ordinary Israeli people who, uh, of course, are fearful of what might come next. As for Iran, Iran has said, uh, repeated again overnight that they uh, might uh, order Hezbollah in the north to conduct a preemptive strike on Israel. And that border zone uh, up in the north has been hugely fortified uh, by the Israelis and hundreds of uh, uh, civilians have been evacuated from the region because that's a, that's, that's a serious second front could possibly open up there uh, for Israel. Uh, so uh, the region, nervous at the moment, Israelis happy that Biden is coming. What real difference he can make, he will boost morale, that's for sure. And secondly, face-to-face -face meetings are, are far better than, as we know, better than phone calls. And as I say, he'll meet with Netanyahu, uh, King Abdullah, uh, the president of uh, Palestinian Authority in in, uh, in the West Bank, and also the president of Al Sisi of Egypt, and uh, you know, he he's a person. Biden's a personable fellow. Uh, he's you know a, a seasoned diplomat as well. Uh, if if he can make a breakthrough, then I, I'm sure he will. Okay, so a couple of things. Well, let's talk about Hezbollah. Uh, the leader of Hezbollah, <coughs> Nasruddin has been speaking recently, and they said if they need to, they would invade. Hezbollah has the armory and the arsenal, close to about 100,000 fighters, 130,000 rockets. They are even stronger than Hamas. What's the possibility of Hezbollah coming into the fight? Because Hezbollah also has an historical antecedent of being beaten blue back by Israel back in the day. So they might be ambivalent. That's one. Can you just talk us through the possibility of Hezbollah coming on to, into the fight. And secondly, the constant yep. attacks on the Rafah crossing. Now they're talking about the possibility of opening Rafah for the Palestinians to be able to move out. But just over the weekend, there was a bomb attack in Rafah around the crossing area. So what does this portend for the people trying to scamper to safety? Well, dealing with Rafah, uh, uh, you know, every Gaza knows that Nowhere in the Gaza Strip is safe, and uh, uh, that uh, particular area around Rafah is, is is sort of open open countryside, and uh, anyone waiting there, uh, I, I personally wouldn't wait, even though it means escaping uh, from Gaza, because there is there is no shelter there. There's nowhere to hide from uh, Israeli rockets. As for Hezbollah, founded back in the 1980s, as you say, they have a vast arsenal uh, said to be more than uh, 100,000 rockets, maybe 130,000 supplied uh, by uh, Iran, Syria, and some sources say South Korea. These are long-range rockets, uh, and uh, if Hezbollah does carry through with its threat to strike, for sure, they will aim some of those effective rockets at cities like uh, uh, Tel Aviv. There, there's no question about that. And these rockets, they're able to pin, use these rockets with pinpoint accuracy. If they wanted to hit the airport at, at Tel Aviv, they could. Hamas, by contrast, just fires volleys of rockets and hope they la land somewhere in Israel. But Hezbollah is, is a different story. And, of course, they're getting help uh, from uh, Iran all the time. All right, uh, let's talk about the humanitarian aid and access to humanitarian aid. 
especially as they say in their supplies are fast running out in hospitals uh, for the people who watch videos of young people on the Gaza Strip talking about just how much this has affected life and just a huge humanitarian crisis on our hands. What's your uh, what's the international world stands on stands on this? So the US, UK, Israel allies. And also, do you think Israel will shift position in terms of agreeing to allow um, aid going to Gaza? I think uh, it depends really on what pressure and what results uh, uh, Biden can make of his conversations with Netanyahu tomorrow. Uh, for the moment, uh, Net uh, the Israelis are uh, um, keeping the status quo and the conditions in Gaza are just beyond description. The hospitals on the brink of being shut down uh, because they, they, they just don't have any medicines and medical supplies left. As for the people, as you saw in my report, they were drinking seawater because there's no water. Uh, and uh, as, as for food, uh, heaven knows what they're eating. Uh, the conditions there uh, are just beyond terrible. My sense is my sense is that the Rafa crossing will open at some point, at least to allow food aid to, to go into, into southern Gaza, in fact, which is where the Rafa crossing is. I believe that's, what, uh, something, that, that's something that the Biden administration can achieve because it's, it, it's easy to do. Uh, you just open the gates. Interestingly, uh, although Egypt, uh, Israel is being criticised for, for not allowing aid in, Egypt doesn't seem to be getting the same criticism. I'm, I'm just wondering why that is. But um, my feeling is, and I, I've got no uh, strong sources on this, but I, my, my feeling is that ultimately that crossing will open uh, to allow uh, Palestinians, perhaps with American passports and other foreign nationals, to leave. There will be no mass exit by allowed by Palestinians because of the Sinai is a sensitive zone for the Egyptians. They don't want thousands, perhaps even a million people entering into uh, uh, Sinai. But on the world stage, El Sisi surely is getting some criticism for not uh, pushing hard enough to get that uh, Rafa crossing open from the Egyptian side. Uh, and uh, every truck will be examined by the Israelis to make sure that there are no arms or of fighters going in from Egypt. Uh, uh, but uh, as I say, my feeling is that if Biden can, this is the biggest thing that Biden can do is to, is to get the Rafa crossing open. And I, I think he might just do that. Well, uh, John, will you consider the US and the UK in particular honest arbiters in this uh, conflict? Considering the fact that the US uh, has sent already two aircraft carriers and it's also uh, providing about 2,000 troops and in uh, the UK, I mean, there's uh, greater concern about how the British have also been caught in the middle of it, about six, you know, Britons already uh, 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 killed. Do, do you think that they are honest arbiters or they are really taking size and just doing things for television? Well, of course, uh, the US and the UK are long-term allies going back uh, uh, <laughs> a long time. And uh, you're right, uh, the uh, US is, will, will have two uh, aircraft carriers and a strike force in, in the region. Uh, my understanding is that the original aircraft carrier is still off Cyprus at the moment, but certainly within range, easy range of Israel. The Brits have got a, a surveillance plane flying over Israel at the moment, supplying the Israelis with intelligence on on phone calls and there are two uh, warships uh, in these British warships in the eastern Mediterranean. This is all to do I, I, I think with two things. First of all if there's going to be any rescue of hostages it may well be that American special forces or British special forces might be involved on the ground although Biden has repeatedly said there'll be no American boots on the ground but uh, special forces are, uh, are something different. And secondly if uh, you know, the region does explode, uh, then uh, these American and British uh, warships will be uh, valuable assets uh, to uh, Israel uh, and, and, and possibly to, to, to the wider region. Okay, <clears throat> so a couple of things. <clears throat> One will ask, Israel is trying to invade northern Gaza, 
But now, the 72-hour timeline it has given has elapsed because of evacuations of people. They have not been able to settle that up with Rafa. Some will ask, why can't that just extend to a more holistic ceasefire and conversations continue? Anyway, I must still posit that airstrikes are still going on around that area. That's the first question. Second question, Biden coming into the Middle East, will it change much? Because Anthony Blinken went to most of those countries that Biden, you know, will be looking to also talk to. Not, he didn't get really anything much. In fact, when Anthony Blinken went to Saudi Arabia, it was delayed for hours before the crown prince decided to see him. And the body reaction was not that great from Saudi Arabia. So what do you say about these two case scenarios? Well, first of all, look, Israel's damned if it does and damned if it doesn't go in. I mean, if it doesn't go in, Hamas survives to fight another day and possibly commit more, more atrocities. If it does go in, then there, there's going to be mass casualties, both on the Palestinian side and uh, on the Israeli side, because it's going to be street to street fighting. Uh, it's going to be absolutely horrendous. Uh, so careful planning has to be made to, uh, and the Israelis have been practicing in the desert in, in mock-up scenarios. Uh, and so but that's Israel's position. It, it, it can't win in this current scenario. If it has a ceasefire, again, Hamas is going to survive. And, you know, politically and, and indeed in world opinion uh, at the moment, uh, uh, Hamas has to be destroyed uh, because of the atrocity that it carried out on October the 7th. I mean, the biggest pogrom on, on, on Jews since the se uh, Second World War. So the, 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 no scenario is, is really good. And, and worst of all, of course, is the plight of the, of the Palestinian people. And uh, America made a huge mistake in 2003 when it invaded Iraq and didn't think about the future. They, they deposed Saddam Hussein hang on, what comes next? And what came next was a country in chaos uh, uh, which led to the birth of Islamic State. So the Israelis are being pressed, I understand, by the Americans to think about what comes next. Look, Israel is a mighty military force. There's no doubt in my mind that Hamas, once Israel goes in, will be routed and destroyed, and many Hamas fighters will uh, try to escape to neighboring countries. But, but Israel has to think about what comes next. Is, it, is, is Gaza going to be, what's left of Gaza? Is it going to be ruled by Israel, which, uh, you know, uh, many Western countries counsel against? Or who else is going to run? Uh, could it be the Palestinians in the West Bank, Mahmoud Abbas, although there's no love lost between Mahmoud Abbas and, uh, and the Palestinians in, in, in Gaza? Could it be the UN? Maybe a UN force could be put in place, uh, which, which could be a, a, a scenario. So you raised three very important points there, and uh, none of them are, are easy to solve. It's a major, major uh, international conundrum. Well, thank you very much for your time this morning, John. We look forward to receiving more updates from you in the coming hours and perhaps days. <laughs>